I have to I have to laugh a little bit. I asked a colleague of mine, you know, should we start on Bay Area time or should we start on on time, on time? And I, I looked at her, I said, what time? She says 508. It is 508. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Creating the Visitor Centered Museum, a conversation with Peter Samus and Lori Fogarty. I'm Susan Sparrow, Professor of Museum Studies at the John F. Kennedy University, and it is just delightful to see so many familiar faces here in the audience. Thank you for coming on this Friday evening, and it's a delight to see so many readers in the room. Um, I'm curious, and I suspect most of you have not, because the book sold out quickly. I was just told it's in its third printing, not just in its first. Um, can I see a show of hands of how many of you at least looked at or put, put your hands on the book? Awesome. Peter and Lori, look around at this. This is about half the room. <laughs> Do it again, just so they can see, quick. <laughs> okay, that's, that's great. That's fabulous. Um, Allow me quickly to do some briefly thank those who've made this evening possible. On the OMCA side, it's Lori Fogarty, director and CEO, to Kelly McKinley, who is now the deputy director. Yay. And Eileen Hansen, that's news this week, by the way. <laughs> and, and to Eileen Hansen, the administrative manager. They have graciously offered us this space and to manage some of the on site details. On the JFKU Museum Studies side, thanks to Chair Adrienne McGraw for her support and to the team of students and alumni who've been here to help. I really want to give a special shout out to our student program assistant, Audrey Blair, who's demonstrated her sense of detail and persistence that it takes to make a program like this possible. We at JFKU Museum Studies are delighted to be the instigator of this particular evening because our values align so well with the spirit and messages in this book. We've been focused on museums and communities essentially since our founding over 40 years ago, and this content is such a great match. So the program tonight is going to go somewhat like this. Peter Samus, Associate Curator of Interpretation at SFMOMA and co-author of the book, he's going to provide us with a quick overview to give the conversation a context. Peter's been at the forefront of figuring out how to use interpretation to support audiences as they wander through museum galleries. Lori Fogarty, then, will join him on stage for a conversation. Lori, too, is a recognized local, national, and international leader for her work in making museums become visitor-centered. She's been a thoughtful advocate and voice for opening up museums to our communities. Then, after their conversation, Peter's going to be outside the hall for a book signing, and if you don't have a book, you can get some in the store. So that'll be a moment to go buy some. And then finally, before we turn to the program, I want to make a few quick comments of my own about the book. In the acknowledgement, Peter and his co-author, education and museum consultant Mimi Michelson, note in the book that it is the result of a dare from a colleague on the DC Metro during a conversation about museum interpretation. In deciding whether or not to take up that dare, Peter initially talked to colleagues to figure out whether or not he should write a book. One of those conversations he had was with me. After he explained his thinking, he then asked me whether or not I thought there was a need. Pretty instantly, I reacted with an emphatic yes. Will you please fill this hole in the literature? And can I have it soon, like tomorrow, in six months? Or I need it now for my classroom. Five years later, <laughs> I have the book in my hands. And um, though to be fair, it is a challenge to do a project like this while simultaneously holding a job and indeed having a life. What a colorful book this is, um, not only with the cover, but this is so cool, this is so cool, but the illustration inside. The color provides more information that will allow my students to better make sense of the case studies. This is a reader-friendly book. My delight with the color aside, more importantly, what struck me as I read this is how brave and honest a book this is for how it reveals the behind-the-scenes dynamics in creating the visitor-centered museum. Perhaps you can imagine the countless conversations I've had as a museum pro studies professor with students, alumni, and colleagues about the messy, complex, and all-too-human challenges that happen when you work in a museum. I suspect that many of you have had similar conversations. That Peter and Mimi gathered these insights with, about the process from museum directors and staff from many departments, then put their discoveries in writing to publicly share them is a gift for us all. This book is deftly writes about the behind the scenes politics and challenges of change. 
Peter, thank you, for your hard work to make it happen and taking up on that dare. And now, please welcome Peter to the podium. Thanks, Susan. Much appreciated. So it's great that this is actually happening, as opposed to sometime in the indefinite future, since we're here. Um, I just wanted to give a quick backgrounder on why we're doing what we're doing. Lights, can you bring the lights down, the house lights down a little bit to get better light on the uh, screen, is that right? Um, some background on, wh on why we set about doing what we're doing and then the museums that we uh, chose to focus on for um, the case studies. Okay, so, um, you know, museums always look great on the outside and they're, you know, magnets and they're on, when SF MoMA opened it was on the front cover of the phone book in San Francisco and, um, but then when you get inside, people have these moments. I'm not quite sure, I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand modern art. This person left a comment card in a, year, a few years back. And here's another one. <laughs> For Sina's benefit, it's, a, it's someone entering a gallery with a camera around his neck with a big question mark say, and an arrow saying me. And then on the walls are these horizontal paintings with exclamation points. And it says, them. <laughs> right? And I've been um, party to this um, conspiracy of museums, in a sense, to um, use technology as a way to perhaps sidestep larger issues we're not always prepared to face. Um, you know, we try to use multimedia as a way to restore some of the context that the white cube of the gallery strips away. Um, but, you know, and, and that seemed to be going well for a while. We were trying to answer the big questions like, why would anyone make this? What's it doing in this big, important museum? I.e., you know, what's remarkable about it? Um, what does it have to do with the other works around it? And what would I be doing if I made this or were in this historic person's boots? Right? In a word, when we did focus groups at SF MoMA among the staff, at showing them works that were going to be in the new building, they said, well, I just want to know why I should care, and, and I will. But the thing is, the elephant in the room is that the vast majority of American museum visitors do not use technology during their visits. So if we're looking at technology as our way of conveying this vital information and saying, oh, we're we've taken care of it, <laughs> done, then we are um, actually really kind of taking an easy way out. And we're not really um, dealing with the, the magnitude of the situation. So that was a question we set out to find answers to. This is Mimi Michelson in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, having been served a, a, a crumpet of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we sent emails out to colleagues and we culled from about 60 sites that were nominated, 10 sites um, as innovators in the field of museum interpretation. They were mainly art museums, but we knew that art museums were notoriously withholding when it came to um, interpretation. And so we actually wanted to include some other kinds of museums as well that might actually raise the bar for us all a little bit. And, um, and OMCA is one of the multidisciplinary museums, for instance, and the Minnesota History Center is uh, obviously a history museum and so on. And then, so we, we, then we did site visits to each of these museums where we spent the first day entirely in the galleries without meeting with anybody on staff. And the second day, we had like a battery of interviews with everyone from the director to the curators and the educators and, and, and more interdisciplinary teams, came out with a thousand pages of transcripts. And that took a little while. And, and it was the five years, that probably took about a year <laughs> to go through that and kind of make sense of it all. And they're from the US and Europe. So here are the museums in rapid succession. The Denver Art Museum, 
which um, actually, this doesn't show you the older building, which is when they started innovating, with, with things like this, uh, this gallery here that's um, the Discovery Library, or the workshop over there by, in the Western Art Gallery where people get to do have their own creative studio and creative moment. I have another photograph of that same space with Stephanie Pau in it from years ago. <laughs> Um, and then they're also thinking about kids and how can we reach kids in an unobtrusive way. Those are all bingo cards um, in that pocket on the left, right at kid height, and then the kids can do a treasure hunt in the gallery and find a way that they can enjoy themselves at the same time that their parents are visiting. Speaking of kids of all ages, here's the City Museum in St. Louis, which is, uh, how many people here have been to the City Museum in St. Louis? Well, that's a lot of people. That's like everybody who's holding a copy of the book. I love that. <laughs> a truly immersive playscape, um, very haptic. It's really about the physical and about going into this kind of adventure wonderland. It's not so much an art museum as a work of art that you move through made by a public sculptor and his team. Then there's the Ruhr Museum in Essen, Germany. How many people have been to the Ruhr Museum? Oh, I had a feeling I'd get you on that one. Okay. <laughs> um, fabulous, it, it's an old coal washing plant, uh, and it's basically kind of a theory of everything written through the lens of that particular geolocation on the planet. Um, you go up this Rem Koolhaas designed seven story escalator, so you're processed into this thing that used to be processing coal from the mine head below. And then you go through these different zones, including this one that actually almost looks like an art, a modern art museum, it was inspired by the bullnose, white, pristine display case aesthetics of art museums. But what do we have inside that specimen object? A black lung from a miner who worked underground right on that location. Here's the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul, run by Dan Spock. Um, Oakland and Minnesota have an unholy alliance to exchange exhibitions, which is when we are the beneficiaries thereof. Things like the 1968 show. Um, and look what they do. They actually reserve galleries behind the scenes in, in which to prototype shows they think they might not have quite down yet and they bring visitors in to try things out, especially the target audiences they want to reach. If it's kids, they bring in kids and they, and they run them through the show. If it's uh, Dakota Indians, um, descendants of the Dakota Wars, they bring them in and the, people, and, and the descendants put down on post-its where the language is wrong. Before the show, this was like a year before the show ever opened. Detroit Institute of Arts, one of those great facades that says, this is all things holy that and precious in our culture. <laughs> and then understanding that the, that the people of Detroit may or may not know or understand or, or have immediate access to the meanings of Renaissance painting, or for that matter, a Richard Long stone line, and giving on-the-spot didactics to say, well, what is it that's remarkable about this work, and what should I be looking at? Not to mention, who, I mean, how many people, I mean, you're, maybe you're going to raise your hand and say you, you love this because I'm asking the question just out of sheer contrariness. How many people go out of their way to see decorative arts in museums? Okay, well, some people do. Some people do. Yeah, I certainly was not one of them. But, <laughs> but I will say that at the DIA, it is one of the most amazing experiences because they put their decorative arts, all that, the chased silver terrines with, you know, with boar and, 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 and um, rabbits sculpted on the, on the lids and the, and the Sevres porcelain and everything else. They put it into the context of, the, as, as a way of like, this is all testament, testamentary evidence as to why the French Revolution was in, inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> And you get to sit at this table and watch the, um, the, the, the peruked servants lay out a, a, a six-course dinner as if you're in a chateau in France with all of the voiceover, you know, hour by hour by hour, and see one dish after another, each more opulent than the last, on the very dishes that are surrounding you in the cases. 
bringing it all back home, as Bob Dylan would say. Columbus Museum of Art, another of that same generation of architecture. Now they have a new building, so they're upgrading that image. Um, wonder Room for kids with artworks in it, and kids get to build things, and there's a Calder mobile. They get to make their own mobiles. Um, this is jigsaw puzzles. That, and that one is inspired by an Arthur Dove painting. That man was about to go back into the military. He was on weekend leave with his wife. They were sitting in the, on a Sunday in the museum, making the jigsaw puzzle together, hanging out. Anyone ever been here? <laughs> OMCA is, and who's that guy? I mean, really, look, <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, there have been many, many, many portraits that have been made before and after that guy made his. This is uh, you are here, wall. And Kelvin Grove, one of these Victorian picture palaces and, and curiosity cabinets in Glasgow, Scotland, where Mark O'Neill, the, the director, when they, re, when they finally decided they needed climate control and they closed it down, said, not only are we going to have climate control, we're going to actually make this relevant to our community. And so they really went over the line in some cases. Like, look at that. This is a, a tabloid um, in, uh, updating of the, the, the choice this woman has to make between the pretty boy, son of the wealthy, and the romantic um, uh, pauper from the countryside. You know, is, is she going to move into a flat in the new condo tower in downtown Glasgow, or is she going to live in a, a bohemian loft at the edge of town? You know. <laughs> um, and finally, here's the Van Abe Museum in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, um, where they have a very irreverent and meta practice about trying to make people more, Charles Esch, the director there. Um, uh, on the one hand, there's the, there's the anonymous museum on the right with all those leads underneath it, you know, that great facade, of course, it looks like a white cube or a white square. Um, and then on the left, this is um, a game master helping people who have taken on roles of pilgrim or tourist or flaneur in their visit to the museum to make them more self-conscious about what it is to visit a museum debrief on a map what they saw and talk about it. And if they actually think through it, they'll get an additional appellation, they'll get a W for worker. You worked this place. Finally, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, uh, Adam Lerner, Sarah Bay, and their crew, who took over a museum that was kind of destined or built to be um, this uh, uh, kind of uh, Kunsthalle for contemporary art, you know, for the collectors of community, and made it into something that it is really much, much more relevant to the community and engaging on many levels, really kind of stretching the, right, the mixed taste lectures, you know, like on uh, Wittgenstein and puppies, or, uh, yeah, you have to connect, you know, first one expert on one, then another expert on the other, and then it's a free-for-all as you try to connect, make connections between the two. Um, and then this was the Art Meets Beast um, dinner, banquet, and bash. So, those are the ten. These uh, two takeaways from our research, visitor-centered innovation goes hand-in-hand hand with museum change. It's hard to do one without the other. And we have to keep reevaluating who is our audience and what do they need for us. These are the starting point of all museum business. Thank you. That's it, one's over. Well, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to see so many old friends um, here in the audience. And first, Peter, I want to just start by thanking you and congratulating you. This is a great accomplishment. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people say that they're going to write a book, and um, now you and Kathy McLean actually have done that, right? <laughs> um, so, and Kathy has a photo in this one. Yes, indeed. Of the Open Museum. Indeed. <laughs> Um, and a few good quotes. So congratulations. And just so people know, too, that uh, Peter and I, I, I actually calculated this. We have, we began working together almost 30 years ago uh, at SFMOMA. So um, 
uh, and there are other colleagues here that almost date back to that time. But um, the first time we worked together is um, Peter had done groundbreaking work in actually creating, it all comes around to labels, and we'll talk about labels, <laughs> but had actually come up with the groundbreaking innovation of printing labels on a Macintosh computer. And I was going to help him try to raise money from Apple. Apple. So, you know, it all, it all comes around. So we've worked together a long time, and it's such a treat for me. And it's an honor, of course, for um, OMCA to be, to be included among the case studies um, among these institutions. So pleased about that as well. Um, so I just want to start a little bit. I mean, your, your first comment was that uh, becoming a visitor-centered institution means, means, means change. And, you know, the field has talked about being visitor-centered for decades. And yet, you know, the, as we were saying, the, the fact that um, this took five years to, to come out, probably not a lot of change happened in that <laughs> time among museums. So I want to talk about what the impetus to change is and what you saw in these institutions, because I think a lot of museums talk about being visitor-centered, but really shifting that into reality is, is really difficult. And among the case studies you saw, what was that thing that said, we're actually going to make this happen? What is that urgent need for change that inspires the, the, the change? Um, I would say a, a couple of factors come to mind first. Is everybody here okay? Yeah. Um, one, one is um, the director has to want it. And the, because if the director doesn't want it, there's no one underneath who's going to be saying, I'm going to give up my privilege, right? But the other thing I would say is that it really helps if you're not in a tourist town. Because if you're in a tourist town, and that could be London or Paris or New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles even, um, you've got half of your annual visitorship coming in the gate just by ticking off the top five things they have to do in that city. If you're, in a, if you're across the bay from a tourist town, for instance, or if you're in Detroit or Columbus, you know, there, you have to develop a relationship with your community because they're the ones who are going to be coming back. And if they're not coming back, your halls are empty. So it seems to me that those are the two things. Yeah, yeah I, we often, I often would say we can get away with anything in Oakland, and we do. <laughs> um, and, and that's true. I think that uh, there's a real compulsion for that change in, in bringing people in. And then I think it is also um, a sense of moral obligation as well. And so I wanted to ask a little bit about that. In these, in these case studies, um, you, you feature some, some, um, some museums that really have had a visionary director, have had somebody who, like the City Museum, where this is their, comes out of their own imagination. And then you feature some museums, and I would include us in, in this group, where it's really been about the team, and it's been about cultivating a sh shared values, uh, bringing folks into the museum, and then bringing, uh, you know, either as consultants or, or collaborators, and then cultivating that kind of culture of learning inside the museum, where it's really about the team. So I just wanted you to comment a little bit on that kind of spectrum of visionary, singular leader to this deep commitment to the, the process of teamwork. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about the necessity of having a leader, but some leaders are kind of autocrats. You know, and you can dictate this. There is not every single museum in this book works the same way internally. Right. You know, Bob Cassily, the artist, the, pub, the public sculptor artist, you know, wizard behind City Museum with the flying buses and planes, you know, he, he loved to destroy things. He, he, you know, forget Picasso, creator and destroyer. It was Cassidy, creator and destroyer. I mean, he died in a bulldozer turnover, you know, at Portlandia, his new cement wonderland, you know. Um, he, was, he was fearless, and he was, you know, constantly creative. And it's like, the only way to get something done in that museum was to say, Bob wants it, right? right? Um, at the Ruhr Museum, I would say that it's largely the vision of Ulrich Borsdor, but he had a big team of a lot of scientists, you know, what they call scientists in Europe, what we call humanists in America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Historians and things like that, you know, Wissenschaft things, you know. Um, and, 
but and then you've got people like Adam Lerner and Charles Esch at the, at the other end of the spectrum with uh, you know MCA Denver. But you know Adam Lerner is a charismatic leader who, uh, along with Sarah Bay, they were both actually working at the Denver Art Museum. They met at the Denver Art Museum, you know, and ironically they felt like, oh no, this is yeah Denver. We think of as like this pioneering. Uh, research, you know, audience research based publishing museum that has led so much visitor centered innovation in the field. They said, oh no, this is so not working. It's still too balkanized. Let's do something completely different. And they ended up doing this, you know, mixed taste lecture series that ended up being getting them, landing them the, the directorship and the head of programs at. MCA Denver in that beautiful David Ajay building. That's, his, that's David Ajay's first museum in America, not the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African American And they culture. were in a strip mall before that. Yeah, they were, right? they were out of Belmar in the suburbs, right. Um, so, so there's this kind of creative ferment there that comes from those two and their inspired uh, playful mania. But on the other hand, they also are able to identify people they can bring in on their team who like that and who they can work with, and then they give them enough rope to hang themselves with, you know, and they don't hang themselves, they do well. Right. So, that, you know, they can create that kind of team atmosphere and pass it on. Right. Um, you know, and I would say Charles Esch at the Van Abe, you know, is another charismatic, you know, intellectual visionary leader who excels in upsetting the apple cart uh, in some ways, and he has to have people who work under him who will make sure that it all holds together. But then these other places like Oakland and Columbus and Minnesota History Center under Dan Spock and, and Detroit, there were, these were the directors who saw, you know, what they, these were large institutions, they knew they needed to work cohesively, coherently across the institution. The staff is much larger in, in a lot of these places, but they had to kind of reinvent their processes. One of the great things, uh, can I just say one thing that Graham Beale did? Is, sure. Since Absolutely. he's another SF MoMA alum, right? right? right. He actually hired Janet and me. Right. Um, when we and were I think back in the day, we would not have thought of Graham being one of the leaders of a visitor-centered institution, <laughs> but <laughs> he, he the came around. He incarnated British aesthetic authority. <laughs> Little did we know that he had been trained under Julian Spaulding, the real, you know, uh, anyway, radical in the, in the UK. In any case, one of the things Graham did was, he said, you know, we need new stories about it. We're reinstalling the entire Detroit Institute of Arts. We need new stories about our collection. And we're going to have the curators pitch stories to focus groups made up of non-specialist members of our staff. We know that the people in finance, the people in operations, care deeply about this museum. They love this museum. They just don't know about art. So we're going to have them represent the great unwashed beyond, who may or may not care about the museum, you know, and, and, and we're going to pick stories to these people, and they're going to give thumbs up or thumbs down on whatever the stories that the curators give are. And, and, and sometimes the curators have to dig pretty deep beyond any of their normal ones in order to get something that would hook, that would have some Velcro for these other, for their colleagues. But they wanted to do it because it was for their, their colleagues. They knew them. Great example. Um, yeah, and I think that that, you know, that, uh, I think some of the work of a director is, is, of course, bringing in the right people, bringing in people who are going to provoke our thinking. Sometimes I think it's just us getting out of the way a little bit, too, and providing the support um, for the good work to happen. So we were talking a little bit about this. Labels. What the hell is the deal with labels, you know? <laughs> you, 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 I mean, the labels are, are, are the, uh, yeah, they're the battleground, right? And yeah. Who so... Th 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 that size. It's, don't they talk about academe, like, the battles are so harsh because the stakes are so low? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah. let's just ask this crap. Like, who has had a knockdown, drag-out battle over labels? Karen Nelson. Sorry. <laughs> Catherine Whitney. <laughs> um... I just, I mean, it is so funny to think about, but uh, there are a number of stories in the book in various case studies, whether it's the size of the font, the size of the label, the number of words, the language of the words, who gets to do it, who gets to write it, who gets to edit it. What's the deal with labels? <laughs> well, well, I think it is a little bit about, you know, 
because it's the only, in, in, in kind of the museum rule book, of, especially the art museum rule book. It's really, it's, it's a neurosis particular to art museums. Uh, I don't know. I think there might be some science museum people that might <laughs> argue well, with that. Well, okay. I just know that it's most aggravated yeah. and most egregious yeah. in art museums. So, I mean, there is this aesthetic of the white cube of the gallery, against which every, that is the kind of irreducible litmus test against which any object, urinals included, can now be deduced as art, right? So in that world, you know, invisibility is paramount, you know, in terms of not distracting. But of course, as you guys learned, when you brought teenagers in from Oakland, you know, they said, what, what did they say when they saw well, the it? It was, you know, why, why is it so white? It feels like a hospital. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, 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 the sterility of right. the environment. That's right. Was How come really there's no color on these walls? What, right. what, was something wrong with you guys? Was it, right. you know, and we're, we're not even talking about black enders. Yeah, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, so anyway, I think that because it's like the one codified thing that actually does pass muster as the way in which art museums are allowed to communicate and have a, a voice with their visitors, that it becomes this in, intensely charged terrain. And, and so people are like, you know, no, my pencil, no, mine, mine, mine. <laughs> yeah, like, but, but it's absurd because, you know, we're not asking the visitors what they need. We're just saying, this is, this is the one tool we have. It's like, every, you know, everything looks like a nail. Everything looks like a label. And, 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 and that this is our problem. If you go to other kinds of museums, and these museums, you know, they've got, you go to Columbus, Marilee Mostaff will tell you about connectors. And she's got a list of 15 different connectors. You know, they're not, and because and, she knows that most people don't read labels. So if they don't, if, if all, if you're, if you're channeling everything into that label, you're, you're, you're freighting it with so much intensity and weight, you know, and, and Maybe it's legible and maybe it's not. Maybe it's comprehensible and maybe it's not. That's where the voice issues are. You know, that's where Graham said, you know, educators, you give some talking point, you know, some, some questions and bullets that you want the curators to answer. You think that the public is going to want to know about this artwork. Curators write pages. And then all that gets sent to Catherine Whitney and a handful of other writers around the country. Make it and they come up with a language that they can go on the labels because we're taking the pen out of your hands and your hands and we're sending it cross country so that neither of you can say, uh -huh, uh -huh, I got it, you, know, you didn't. <laughs> well, and I remember when we were reinstalling our galleries and, and Kathy McLean, who worked with us, said to our history curator, okay, we're gonna pretend like there are got not going to be any labels in the gallery. She almost passed out, our former senior curator of history, but I think when you, you know, that's another way to think about don't, don't depend. As yeah. you said, it's not all about the labels. It's how else are you going to connect? At SF MoMA, we, you know, when we've had like 12 different modalities for connecting with people around an artwork or around a show, that's what works. Right. Because each one reinforces the others. Right. Analog and digital. So that, I mean, th that coming to that conclusion obviously comes from a lot of work with visitor evaluation and prototyping and testing. And that's just absolutely one of the key themes of the book is these institutions who have had a real commitment. You know, and I'm quoted in the book saying, I remember when we were interviewed, I think it was by Art Forum or Art in America, uh, right before the opening of the museum, and I was talking about prototyping, and the, and the writer said, what is prototyping? <laughs> um, so I, yeah. let's re rewind. rewind. <laughs> um, so I just want you to talk a little bit about the importance and, and how, you've, how you've seen, I mean, there's a whole range described in the book from dedicating spaces like Minnesota does yeah. to the focus groups and, you know, focus groups with the finance and operations staff. So right. a little bit about the importance you see and if, is that a real link between these kinds of institutions? Yeah, it is for most of them. Not, now, I, I can't say, you know, th there's no, it's not universal. Once again, like, you know, Bob, Bob Cassily would have been like Steve Jobs. You know, we don't do focus groups. We, we, we make it and they want it. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, but by and large, I would say that most of the museums, all the museums that work um, by team depend on both small, capital E, as um, Malore McDermott would say at Denver, excuse me, both capital E and small e evaluation. 
So capital E is when you bring in Randy Korn or some you know, outside consultant, and they actually do uh, you know, a, a rigorous, or Wendy Malik or others, yeah. Uh, and, and they do a, a, a rigorous evaluation of what, um, you know, what, the, what your visitors understand or don't understand about a topic, you know, what the teachable moments might be, what their misconceptions might be, and, 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 we're, and, and you get some real data from which you can begin to develop an interpretive design, right? Small e is like you go into the galleries and you talk to people. You go into the galleries and you, and you watch people and you observe them. You, know, you, 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 you mock something up. And you, you do a paper prototype. You run it by them. You, you, sit, you, sit in the, you sit in the atrium and you say, you know, does this make sense to you? you know, what, what are your questions? That, you know, both of those become key. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, I, I'm curious if, if people see that this is happening more and more. I mean, we know in science and history museums that it's happened for a long time, but I'm curious if, if, you, if you feel like you're seeing more of that in art museums. I mean, SFMOMA now has in-house evaluation, right? Um, to some extent. Well, I remember, where's Kelly? So last year we, yeah. were, we were at um, the Association of Art Museum Directors Conference, and we asked the audience, there were over 200 art museum directors there, how many museums had in-house evaluation? Maybe two. We were one, right? And Detroit was one of the others, so yeah. interesting. And Detroit had two at one point. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And ours has a split personality, so it's Yeah, you know, so it's, it's almost good. the same thing. Right. Um, <laughs> but, it, so but, it, but it's absolutely essential. Uh, I, I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. Because how do you know if you're, making the, if you're hitting the mark if you don't know what the mark, where the mark is? Yeah, otherwise, the mark is the one that you have in your head, which is then you're talking to yourself again. That's right. That's right. Um, well, I, and then uh, the other, and you know, the challenge I think too for art museums in particular, and I think you talk about this one with um, with the Columbus Museum, mm -hmm. which is the role of the artist. And when you are working with a living artist and their vision around how their work is presented in the gallery, you know, coming up with that challenge that you know there may be other interpretive voices bringing the visitor's perspective in, saying, you know, you have this wonderful idea about your aesthetic but our visitors are just not gonna go for that. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the biggest issues you, you saw or heard about, especially in contemporary well, art museums? Well, with contemporary art museums, that's, it's absolutely essential that the, that, the art, I mean, that the artists understand that the museum puts visitor experience, um, puts a premium on visitor experience. And so that they're not gonna just, they're not gonna say, bend over and say, you know, whatever the artist wants, we're going to keep it completely pristine. We're not going to have any interpretation. We're not going to have any, you know, any bridge between, you know, I, I mean, this is the contradiction in contemporary art because, of course, everybody, if you're a contemporary artist and you're finally being given a show in a museum, in a gallery space, you want it to look like every, uh, you want it to look different, but you want to look, you want that, that white cube of the gallery to be just as pristine for you as it was for everybody beforehand. And you don't want to start, you know, polluting and junking it up with all that, you know, dumbing down the ultimate taboo, the ultimate tar, the ultimate brush to, put, to bring to anybody. You might as well call them a commie in the McCarthy era. I mean, you know, th this idea that, uh, that actually communicating with people is tantamount to dumbing down. And, and so there's this, um, you know, so in visitor-centered museums, they lay out the ground rules in advance and they say it's gonna be really important that we actually that whatever you do, we frame it in ways that our visitors, whom we know, whom we are, have, have researched and are experts in, um, will be able to appreciate what you're trying to do here. And not just the cognoscenti that, you know, in, in New York or somewhere else, um, who would come in and recognize it as, oh, very hip. That's interesting. That's intriguing. That's uh, that, that there, you know. It has to, be, has to go further than that. Yeah. And I think you know, it goes for traveling exhibitions and guest mm -hmm. curators. I, you know, it's, it's almost like you have to sort of go, have, go through the initiation rites. Um, yeah. I mean, we, have to, we face that all the time with traveling exhibitions. And mm -hmm. OK, you know, this is of interest, but we're going to have a lounge. Mm -hmm. Just warning you. Yeah. So, um, uh, so Getting into the structure discussion and okay. the silo busting. So beyond this, you know, I think you, the book makes such an important point about this goes beyond, you know, interpretive planning and new ways of, of audience research and evaluation. It goes to the heart of how the museum is organized and 
the structural challenges and the culture change that's um, involved. And I just wanted you to speak a little bit to, I mean, that's where I think, Susan, you said you were, it was really brave. These are hard decisions. They're hard hiring decisions. Mm. They're hard firing decisions. Mm. Um, and just kind of how you, how, how forthcoming were the institutions that you mm. talked to about this? And um, how much do you now see coming out of the other side of writing this book that that's a really critical ingredient? Oh, I think there's no question. This is, it's huge. I mean, and we were so, we were humbled by how honest people were around that table, you know, in each, in, in, in each museum we went to. And also how passionate they were and how enthused they were and also, and, 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 and how much they kind of enjoyed working together, you know, but even if they had different points of view, you know, but that they were all really passionately committed to both the museum and its public. And, and, and they were, and, and a place like Minnesota, I mean, you think, you know, they, those people have been working together for so long. They are such a high performance team, you know, between the, the exhibition designer and the, and, and they don't even have a word curator there. They've got like the exhibit developer or something, and then they've got the, uh, um, um, you know, the education person and the media person, and they've got, and, and they're all around the table and they're figuring it out together, and they all are in it to make sure the visitor, that whatever it is they're putting out there is going to be like, is going to connect with their audience, is going to be communicated. If it's not communicated, then they feel like they failed. So, you know, that's, that's a model. You know, to get past, and, and they've done, been doing it for 20 years, so they're really long past that, the pain point. Right. But a lot and of I other places are still in the pain point. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a big part of it. It takes a long time, yeah. longer even than a book. Um, <laughs> yes. um, Snap. Be, yeah, and, and it's, uh, and you know, it's, uh, Kelly has an expression sort of rinse and repeat, because you think you've done it, and you think everybody gets it, and you think everybody's on board, and then there's a moment where, oh, okay, we're, we're back in it. So, uh, Some, someone said to me um, uh, a couple of days ago, I was said I was going to be here and we were going to be talking and, and you said, and, and they said, oh, and the organization chart, I love the organization chart, it's like a flower. I said, I think they've moved beyond that one now. <laughs> it's a four leaf clover, yeah. it's even luckier. <laughs> um, so my last question, because I know we want to uh, turn it over to you all to ask questions as well, but you know, it was interesting it, it, you know, we were the first institution that you all interviewed because the BART, you know, fair was more yeah, reasonable. We didn't need a crest grant to get to, to the Oakland. Netherlands. <laughs> um, but you know, it is kind of interesting to me because I think we talked five, yeah, five years ago, and you know, I see our trajectory really in the last few years. You know, the focus on being a visitor-centered institution, and then I would say moving toward being a really community-centered institution. And now I think we're in a place of really actually feeling an activist responsibility in uh, this community and in these times to really have a, you know, we think of our mission now as to, you know, beyond even what we thought of even just a few years ago, but as contributing to a more caring and equitable community and city. So I'm curious now, as you've thought about this, kind of that trajectory, if you are seeing in the museum world among some of these visitor-centered institutions, that kind of move to, that it starts with being visitor-centered because if you're not visitor-centered, you can't be community-centered and you can't contribute to, in a real, you know, broader sense of social and public impact to your community. But I, it, you know, you, it's very explicit in the discussion of the Glasgow Museum, you know, a, a democratic manifesto. So, a small d. Um, Please. And <laughs> so I'm just curious, well, I think it was a capital D in that case, yeah. but anyway. I, your, your sense of, is, does this move toward that even broader, this, this commitment to being visitor-centered starts to move toward a different kind of positioning around values and purpose. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I, I thank you for talking about OMCA and, and, and your own transition here, because you guys are a model in that. Um, and, and I think that Kelvin Grove in Glasgow is another model where they wanted to make sure that the stories that mattered to the people of Glasgow were reflected in their galleries, on the one hand. But, but the community-centered thing, is, uh, there are two sides to it. On the one hand, you want to be community-centered because you want your community to feel comfortable when they come in and when they become visitors. But then there's another movement, which is when you go back out into the community. Uh, and, and I think that actually, 
um, in some ways, SF MoMA is actually excelling or moving in that direction in a really fruitful way. Um, but what I would say about, I just want to mention that what Glasgow does is they actually have um, the Open Museum, which is um, this, it, it, it too has two parts. There's a, there's a facility at the edge of town where most warehouse facilities are. They're perennially at the edge of town, where anybody from Glasgow can go and ask to see anything in the collections of all the museums in Glasgow, because they're all public city museums, you know, mo or, or many of the museums in Glasgow are city-owned museums. Um, and they can, whether it's, you know, anything that's not on view in the galleries can be seen there. It can be... Uh, the, the rack of Salgado photographs that I saw in storage, or a Rembrandt, or any, you know, whatever, or, or the old, you know, London, you know, not, it wouldn't be London, or Glasgow bus, you know, omnibuses, or things like that. Anything that's not on view, people can go see. Um, but then conversely, they can also, they also have these kits that community groups can take out and make little exhibitions in, their, in the senior centers, in the halfway houses for the mentally, um, you know, uh, uh, for the mentally ill, um, you know, and, you know, all the, for schools, for rotary clubs, they can, they can check out exhibits on 50 or 60 different topics, and they can submit suggestions for exhibits they would like to see, and then those exhibits in turn will be curated in time, as capacity allows, and they can check them out, and those are actual objects from the collection, which they belong to the people of Glasgow. That kind of radical collection access is, is a model, um, definitely. Well, I think with that, um, we're going to raise the lights up and open it up to you all. And Susan is here to help facilitate, but I think we can see you. And, <laughs> and oh, who's that man? I'll hand it to John. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks. Um, I'm really curious of what you learned about um, longitudinal ev evaluation, which has for a long time been a kind of holy grail for museums. Um, prototyping, talking to people as they walk out. Um, it takes a lot of work. You have to be committed to it. But trying to figure out what people learned that they don't know they learned right when they looked at what you showed them and, and when they left. I remember we had a conference maybe 15 years ago at SFMOMA about that. And hardly anybody had figured out how to do it. They were trying to do it at Monterey Bay Aquarium, I think. Um, is there, do you see any motion in that area? You know, um, the good news, I, mean, I know John Falk's been doing a lot of work in this. Uh, in, in this area, and the good news is that we're not the only two resources in this room, <laughs> and there are people here who know more about this and teach this. So, uh, anyone want to take this on? Margaret, uh, Lisa, Wendy. Uh, what Longitudinal. Yeah, long-term studies over time, uh, and what we know about what what people retain. Sounds uh, like a master's thesis to me at JFK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing it. <laughs> So Crystal Bridges, even though they're a new institution, so. Yeah. And they've done it specifically around school field trips, right? Mm -hmm. In the back. I have two questions, if I may. First, you mentioned about the director that has to have a visionary, you know, vision. And first, how would you, um, what are the requirements that you think or the education that a director in order to have that vision should have? That's one of my questions. The second question is, if you look in the future yourself going into a museum, what would you like to see? And how would you, uh, how would you like to see in order for you to to feel a welcome visitor? Great, good questions. Um, and Laurie, feel free to chime in on this one, <laughs> on both of these. I would say that, I, she's the director after all, so she, but my sense of directorial training would be, um, on the one hand, you have a subject matter expertise, so you can appreciate what scholarship really is, um, but that's almost less required than having a real sensitivity to your community and, a, and your audience and making sure that you um, have a, know how to communicate. 
and, and, you can, and then you can obviously have the administrative chops, the managerial skills to keep all of those wheels and gears that will make the engine turn in that direction of communication um, you know, in service of your public, you know, that's where the managerial skills come in. As, you know, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the vision is how you inspire everybody to move in the same direction. As Lori said, when she arrived as the director of the Oakland Museum of California, um, there was already a gallery remodel in progress. They had, they had received bond fund, funding to do a gallery remodel. And she said, we would have had some really nice fonts. <laughs> she pulled the plug on that. Go ahead. No, I, I think that's, I mean, I think part of it is, um, you know, it's, it's like I say about being a parent. If I really believed that my children were tabula rasa and it was all, you know, nurture, I would be so freaked out <laughs> that I would have that much influence. And it's kind of like, I feel the same way about being a director, which is, it's actually more about listening and have, hearing, you know, putting together a team um, who you're willing to trust and, and actually be challenged and uh, change your mind and um, be ready to hear new voices. And, you know, I, I want to say Jay Shu was in the room from the Asian Art Museum. He would probably uh, say the same. But, you know, I really credit um, the, you know, the, the people, I mean, Kathy and Karen and, you know, who were part of our reinstallation and now Kelly and Penny and others who, who will say to me, we're on the wrong track or this has got to be different or are you ready to, you know, go out on this limb? And so there's a little bit of courage, but there's also, it's, you know, I, I don't see myself as having the singular vision of where we're going. I see this being an act of, you know, of co-creation with our staff and our community. And then every once in a while having the courage to be able to say, wow, we, we're going to have to do something different then. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And asking where we're going for the future, I think that's part of asking our community what we need to do and what needs we need to respond to. And where we need to contribute. It's, it's, it's both about where we see we want to be, but it's also most important to say to our community, what do you need? Where can we play a role? And how can we contribute to, you know, to your imagination and inspiration and to the betterment of our community? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hi, um, I'd like to uh, have some thoughts about agile and nimbleness. Um, uh, Laura, you talked about some social community activism. Uh, a week ago, the Trump administration announced a travel ban from seven countries, and a week later, MoMA New York had an installation of artists from those seven countries. They Bravo. Yeah. Yay. They didn't really? do any prototyping, you know, and so I'm wondering what about, you know, uh, visitor-centric museums being nimble, quick-witted, and risk-taking um, in these uncertain times and different times? Well, we're trying hard to do that, and, and you can speak to this too. I mean, it is, we talked a lot and have talked over the years about being nimble and being agile and responsive, and that's both in exhibits and galleries, but also in programming. And, you know, it was very frustrating for a long time that we, we didn't have that muscle, you know? And we've now, the, the two exhibitions that we've done these past two summers on Oakland, one was Oakland, I want you to know, and one was um, uh, Who is Oakland? You know, we developed both of those exhibitions in specific response to issues in Oakland in galactic time, which was for us less than a year. But then, more, more recently, um, we, are, we do have a section at the front of the History Gallery. We're thinking of calling, we were calling it History Under Construction. We're now calling it History Now which we hope that we can turn around in a matter of weeks or months in response to current issues. So we do have, if, you know, check it out while you're here if you can, because it's very simple and it does have objects from our collection, but it's, um, it's an installation related to uh, the American treatment of Native Americans. So it has a, a collection object related to the bond that the U.S. government put out in the 1850s uh, reimbursing white settlers for exterminating Native Americans, and then the Dakota Access Pipeline um, issue. 
And, you know, with credit to the team here, too, um, you know, sometimes it's a little more lighthearted. We actually turned around an exhibit case of the Warrior Steph Curry tennis shoes <laughs> that were auctioned for the ghost ship uh, fire victims fund in three weeks. And so we're trying. And that's going to be really, I mean, I think that's going to be part of our biggest challenge, whether it's programmatic or, you know, in, in uh, physical exhibitions, and is to be able to be responsive and, and to try to do that. And a lot of credit to our team who has now, you know, figured out how to turn this kind of thing around. A lot of them are here, so. I, I, I just want to add one thing, which is that that speaks worlds of, about how OMCA has turned into a community-centric institution, you know, where that people aren't going to wait for a blockbuster to come here necessarily. You know, it's, you know, it's because there every Friday night there's something going on here. You can come back again and again. There's a reason to be here on a much more frequent basis. So that having this kind of rhythm of being responsive, if, if you're only changing your exhibitions, you know, seasonally and you're only going once a year, then it's not that important to be responsive on that kind of a basis. But if you're actually beginning to engage your community and your community is beginning to come a, on a more frequent basis, then that dialogue can actually be meaningful. Right. And I would say the, the, um, the native, the, the installation we just did is a prototype. I mean, you'll see that there, you know, there are things that are paper up there because we hope that this will infuse our history gallery reinstallation with more content on the issues of native genocide. So, other questions? Uh-oh, this is a scary row right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is, is this the agent provocateur? <laughs> uh -huh. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm doing a session at AAM this year called mm. Struggling Towards Visitor-Centeredness. <laughs> Slouching toward Bethlehem. Yeah. <laughs> Crawling. Yeah. Um, and... It's really come up because I've been noticing in the last two years or so that, um, that there's an incredible pushback going on in museums that's very similar. In fact, nine months ago, I said to colleagues, this feels like you know, there's a kind of the same thing that's happening with Trump in, the, in the, the greater country is also happening with museums in that there's a kind of very, I'm experiencing a very fierce pushback from people of privilege within the museum community and say, they, they mouth the words and they talk the talk, but in fact they are very much more conservative than they've been in years. And I was wondering if you've noticed the same thing and if you have any, I mean, just the fact that you're at AAMD and you, and the only two people Two museums have um, evaluation people after all this, after 30 years. AMD, for this. those who don't know, is the Association of Art Museum Directors. So, uh, and I'm really concerned about it, although now I think what's going on in our country as a whole is kind of eclipsing it, but it's still there. There is this very um, subtle pushback that really bothers me, and I wondered if you could. I'm, I'm curious, do other people feel like you're seeing that, or other folks seeing that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Tina, say more. What is, where, how are you detecting it? Yeah. That wasn't really an invitation to comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was. It really was. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I suppose I'll weave this into the comment I was going to ask you, but I, I don't want to hijack the, the, the previous question. Um, but it, it sounds like the the core of this issue has to do with the return of agency to the visitor because uh, representation, whether it's uh, persons of color or people with disabilities or you know, different sexual orientations, whatever, whatever the case may be, um, is, is, is uh, pretty, pretty lacking. Um, pretty lacking not only in terms of the, uh, the artworks on, on, on presentation and things of that nature, but, but uh, it, is, uh, it tends to be treated as a one-off event. And so, when I was hearing that uh, question, and the reason I said absolutely is because you know there's a lot of talk of um, you know inclusive design. I mean, it's the field I happen to be most familiar with, inclusive design or accessibility. Um, but in terms of action, it, it definitely is a little different. And then when I talk to my friends of color, it's it's very similar things in terms of you know diversity programs and things of that nature. But then uh, there are very few museums in which they, as visitors, whether they're museum professionals or some you know, the, the member of the, uh, you know, the, the unwashed masses and, uh, you know, they go into to museums and, and, and they don't feel like it is a museum for them. So, so that was the, the, 
reasoning behind my, uh, my utterance of absolutely. Um, you know, I guess my part, I, that's really interesting, and I'm going to be paying a lot more attention to it, and I do think that there is... In your is new capacity as president <laughs> of AAMD. <laughs> yeah. But... Change them, Lori. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's... Um, one of the things I do notice and I get asked about a lot is, does, does a lot, meaning by certain, you know, voices, is, does being a visitor-centered or a community-centered institution mean a diminishment of commitment to collections, to scholarship, to research, and, you know, having to answer so many times the, it is not an either-or, it is an and-both. And, so I, I see that, and I think maybe there is a feeling in some museums that the pendulum swung so much toward, you know, toward you know, the power of the educator um, that there may be that kind of backlash. And I wonder what it'll be you know, in these current times when there is going to be more sensitivity in some parts of the country to, um, you know, to the political content. But, you know, and I've also gotten asked, so you know, the Oakland Museum of California used to do art shows. When are you going to do art shows again? So, you know, there's, yeah, there are those tensions for sure. I, I would say one other thing along those lines, which is that with the um, resurgent power of the art market and the you know, hyperinflated uh, prices of contemporary art in particular, I mean, you know, you can get Rembrandt prints that pulled by the master's hand for far less than, you know, much contemporary art by 30-year-olds, you know. Um, there, um, I think that there's like, it, it exerts a certain star power and, and it brings a certain, you know, it, it kind of it becomes its own authority and, and it doesn't, it's not even about like interpreting it or getting it. It's just like doing a selfie in front of it. You know, what the Broad is full of people doing selfies in front of every object in that collection, you know, and, and, and it's the most popular social media phenomenon of any art museum on the planet. You know, people, you know, it, it, it's, it's dense in there. I mean, people are going and going back and they're bringing their friends and everything else. Whether they're, you know, what, what, they're, what, what the nature of that connection is, other than that, like, here I am alongside this celebrity object. It's kind of like star chasing, you know. So there's a certain conservatism from, from our progressive liberal, neoliberal point of view, <laughs> you know, where we actually want to talk about, like, well, why did the artist make that that way? You know, that's almost like irrelevant. You, they fly right over it. Yeah. I, what my, um, my question kind of ties into to this, and what you haven't talked about yet is the funding, and how my impression, in agreeing with what Kathy is seeing al also, is um, museums, maybe it's the boards, I don't know where it comes from, doesn't think that these kinds of programs and exhibitions will draw a lot of money. Which, and, which and kinds? Visitor-centered. Visitor and, and a big part of your job, Lori, you know, has to be raising money, and how, how do you sell this? Well, you know, Stay tuned. I think, I mean, I think <laughs> that it's, I, I, you know, I'm, we're making a big, you know, we're, that's exactly what we're doing right now is actually trying to make our case that this museum, to support this museum because of this commitment to, you know, access to equity, to visitor-centered focus. And I do think there are some philanthropists that are interested in giving to the institution, particularly because of that focus. I mean, I can't say we're out, you know, we've got it all figured out on the financial side, but, you know, I do think that's what we're trying to do, is to actually say that mission is what we're raising money toward fulfilling. And I think we're seeing some success with that. And I also will say that the current exhibition, All Power to the People, Black Panthers at 50, has been one of the most successful exhibitions we've ever had from an audience standpoint, members, you know, we didn't, we didn't attempt to try to raise a lot of philanthropic support for it, but we did, including our women's board, so that's progress. Um, you know, our, our white elephant sale. Uh, uh, white elephant sale for the Black Panther Party. I know, it's, you know, <laughs> who'd have thought, you yeah. know? 
Can't um, make these things up. You cannot make yeah. these things up. So, but I think you're right. I think that's a risk. I think people are worried about that. That's a really important point. I'm doing a little bit of a time check. Yep. We're at 6.13. We actually okay. have time for one more question. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, coupling on the funding, I would imagine that for institutions like a much larger institution like whether New York MoMA, SF MoMA, the DeYoung, that has a board that probably is a far wealthier board that it donates their collection and wants their name on it and is probably much more invested in the white cube that maybe smaller institutions, whether it's by the cities or you know, in terms of the communities, in some ways you have a lot more freedom and flexibility, and so I'd like that addressed. And then I just want to make a quick comment that at the Women's March, because this was right en route, and I actually stopped in to use the facilities. We said that we were meeting an urgent community I want need. you to know <laughs> that this was the, the, the museum, there were so many, I mean, there were hundreds of people coming in through, whether it was to use the bathrooms, get coffee, with hats, with signs. You had the, the, the graffiti board that was there and the Panthers exhibition, and I just, I, want, I just cried. I just said, this was such an important institution that felt so resonant right now, and I just wanted to thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it, it really was funny because Kelly and I had a text, because I was out at the march, and, I, and she was inside. I said, how's it going? She said, we may run out of toilet paper. <laughs> and I said, okay. Do you, I thought, should I go get some? I'm not going to be able to get back in there, you know? But, um, but yeah, no, we, we were really proud of our visitor services staff because I will tell you, you know, the visitor-centered focus is at every level. I mean, it's facilities and operations and visitor experience, and they were all there on that. And I will say, trying to be responsive, um, don't all rush our, our uh, acquisition process. We're collecting signs from the march. So, um, so if you have a really good one, you can let us know. Really and there were a lot of really good ones. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. We'll need our paper conservators on full full duty um, in the coming months. I think we but should probably wrap up. This was um, really a treat to be with you all uh, this evening to kick off um, the the next life of this Great. book in published Great. form. Thank Good. you, Laurie. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Laurie and Peter. And I will, I will end by also saying a big part of being a visitor-centered institution is about the beer. And um, so we do hope you'll stay and uh, local and uh, stay and enjoy our Friday nights if you're uh, available. And I think, Susan, you're going to say something about the books. And Just really quickly, if you want to get your copy of a book, if you don't have one already, they are some for, for sale in the store. And Peter's going to sit outside at that table and sign away. So thank you all for coming.